All right, how's it going, everybody? My name is Antonio, and you're watching Resource Heads, the only news regurgitating show on YouTube where a soul is ginger. Not that there is so full of gingers, we, we all lack a soul, but where a soul is ginger with a funny accent tries but mostly fails to understand what's happening in the markets and how that's influencing or maybe isn't or might or might not be influencing the commodities markets while also trying to be funny but also mostly failing in that. Uncomfortable jokes aside, though, I have a uranium geologist, James Sykes, who I will um, talk to you about the uh, about, well about the uranium, obviously, because the price keeps going up in what is otherwise a depressed and uh, a, 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 you know generally a boring period for the market. We're going to be talking about Kazan Prom's first half of 2023 results. We'll talk about Cuppy's 245 million pounds of uranium demand projection that he put out on Twitter this week. We're going to be talking about the ever-growing bifurcation of the market with Saudi Arabia potentially turning to China for its nuclear future. But in the same time, the U.S., though, keeps importing Russian uranium, and quite heavily, too. We had a record-setting uh, first half of the year for importing Russian uranium in the U.S., so that's interesting. Then we'll be talking about how, what, and why uh, the U.K. is putting um, uh, a rocket, really, under its nuclear expansion with a big stimulus uh, that that's supposed to be coming. We're going to be talking then in the end, we're going to be talking about Japan's decision to discharge radioactive water into the ocean and what that might mean and why or why it isn't scary. Oh, and we're also going to be talking about Rio Tinto, who decided to sell some of its uranium exploration assets this week. While all of us are, are bullish, they decided to sell some of their assets. And I believe they're completely out of uranium now. After that, uh, as always, I'll let Luke Tenhava walk me through the junior market and tell me what's been happening there and um, also teach me uh, what, what I believe is a valuable lesson. It's just a good conversation, actually, and he, he was very well prepared, so that was interesting. Uh, but let's first talk about what kind of week it's been. It's been, um, well, it's always really an interesting week, but overall, this was a, a calm week. Uh, it was a risk-on week with NVIDIA outperforming the earnings expectations NVIDIA is, is just done amazingly in terms of earnings and free cash flow, but that's not what we're going to be talking about. Um, but there was also weak PMI data out of the US and the EU. Uh, Germany uh, fell further into a recession with a third consecutive uh, quarter of GDP declines. And um, all of that was giving giving the market a fresh dose of hopium that we might be close to the, the end of the hiking cycle. That, of course, has pushed um, stocks and bonds even higher, but it even pushed the um, the dollar higher. And at the same time, gold is also higher too. So that was an interesting dynamic, but not that much when you look into why it, it all might be happening. The NASDAQ closed up almost 2%. The TLT bond index closed up almost 3%. And DXY closed up almost 1%. With the dollar closing higher, mainly due to a weaker euro and a weaker yen too, because uh, weak economic data from both the, the EU and China is making the case for rate cuts in the EU and more stimulus to come from China. And uh, yeah, China is still struggling to gain traction uh, on its economic recovery because based on the data presented to us in the West, at least, which is not necessarily the whole truth and nothing but the truth, but I hope it's at least based in the truth, their manufacturing sector, their retail sector, their um, real estate sectors, they're not doing too well. They are struggling. There are signs of struggles there. Uh, interestingly enough, though, they made a, an interesting choice this week, deciding not to cut the five-year loan prime rate while only barely cutting the one-year loan prime rate. And if you hear me saying interesting a couple of more times, just click away. It's not really going to get better throughout this video. The loan prime rate is, by the way, basically the, the, the lowest interest rate that Chinese commercial banks offer to, well, prime customers, so higher credit quality customers, basically. But so the one-year LPR is generally the rate for personal loans. So think, I'm thinking about smaller loans, loans that may influence consumer behavior on, on cheaper goods or lower-priced items, basically. While well, the five-year LPR is the benchmark for the mortgage loans. So they're basically stimulating consumer consumerism, uh, but not necessarily stimulating the real estate sector, which is indeed an interesting development. And as you remember from last week, the LPR, specifically the five-year LPR, was expected to fall to 4% or 405, depending on who you asked, as the Chinese property sector is showing signs of struggles. And so it was expected that the PBOC would try to stimulate it by cutting the rates that most mortgages are based on. Well, it turns out they didn't, and that's an interesting thing. The PBOC, that's short for the People's Bank of China, of course, they decided to keep the five-year LPR at 4.2%. This is not a low rate for them. And so with dwindling retail sales, falling industrial production, and so a struggling manufacturing sector on top of a struggling property sector, most economists out there, 
for whatever is worth or they well, they think that the Chinese central bank is doing too little too late and that it's playing with with a with a fire that could eventually burn down the whole economy uh which might or might not be an exaggeration. So it, it should come as no surprise, by the way, that the Chinese industrial profit was also seen dropping this week by 15.5% as the um as the central bank is trying to... Some some people are saying that they're trying to save their currency and that they're dumping US dollars and so on and so forth. But again, the quality of the data is really low for me to be able to, to draw a quick conclusion on that, although it is interesting to speculate on. But it's also worth noting that it's not like China isn't doing anything to stimulate its economy okay they announced this week that they will allow 12 of the most indebted provinces to issue special refinancing bonds worth as much as 1.5 trillion yuan that's about 210 billion us dollars so no it's not maybe it's not as straightforward as just putting money into people's bank accounts but they are doing something the effect of which is again not as straightforward i have no idea what it would be but so far i haven't really found anybody talking about how it may be strategic you know, it might be a strategic stimulus for all we know. So far, I've only found arguments saying that China is not doing enough. But maybe, and just maybe, they know what they're doing. Again, I'm, I'm speculating here, and I don't have any data to substantiate that speculation. But as the saying goes, don't fight the PBOC. Just kidding. Nobody ever says that. But don't fight communism, I guess, because they'll throw you they'll throw you in a working camp for disagreeing. And while I say this half joking, jokingly, it comes down to, it does come down to this being, a, you know, what, essentially a communist economy. Um, it, 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 just the communist economy is not as straightforward to bystanders as a capitalist economy might be. And I'm uneducated in both types of economy, so I should not be taken seriously in any case. But it is worth noting that literally nobody is bullish on China. Mainstream media, whatever it might be, YouTubers, I'm sure that there is a cool way of saying this. Well, I cannot think of it right now because it comes down to mainstream media generally being a good contrarian signal, right? And that's because we don't tend to have massive moves in markets when everybody is expecting them. Just like a few months ago, well, about a year ago or so, I guess, everybody was bullish on the Chinese reopening, right? And they expected incredibly high levels of economic activity, which they expected to boost commodity demand and and. Well, as you would remember, that didn't necessarily materialize as expected. Uh, again, this is just a sub, just something that I'm throwing out there. It's a gut gut feeling type of thing for 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 you know whatever it is. But go go on to any news website. Go to go to any news website, China section specifically, and you see big scary headlines. Go to your generally um, bearish podcast. I interviewed David Rosenberg. Uh, this week, the interviews up on the channel it actually did good, you know, in, in terms of views. He's extremely be bearish on China and so on and so forth. Um, and I guess I tend to believe these news as well because I'm seeing the same data as everybody, but as everybody else does, right? So I, well, I guess technically I should believe it because that's what the data is pointing towards. But the contrarian in me is is just getting a little suspicious that counter arguments on China are not as easily found. It's not that they don't make sense; they're just not as easily found. That's all that I'm saying is basically everybody's bearish on China. Now, last week, I, I talked long about China and gold, where I, I said that if if uh, if the retail sales don't get a stimulus-induced uptick, that might not be great for gold over the short run, as China is the biggest consumer of gold, and, and specifically China's jewelry sector is. And uh, that if there, I also mentioned that if there would be any any signs of hope for China, gold might be, um, as a forward-looking commodity, might be uh, an indicator to tell us that there is hope by going up, because again, China's consumers love gold. If there's hope for the economy and consumers are consuming, you know, rapidly, that should show up in in the gold price. Well, this week, the stimulus news, um, gold liked seems to like seem to like the stimulus news, and it closed the week up over a percent. That happened despite the uh, most infamous party pooper Jerome Powell giving a speech that could basically be summarized by him saying what he's been saying for about a year now. Uh, higher for longer because inflation is not where we want it to, and we still want it at two percent. So therefore, we are not scared of hiking rates further if we need to. Um, putting the emphasis on if they need to and data driven and so on. So it's basically the same thing that he's been saying for a while now, and he's done what he's been saying. He's been data driven, and uh, inflation has not hit two percent, so he's not stuck. I don't deem it that complicated, uh, but maybe I'm oversimplifying it. So perhaps it was the China stimulus thing. 
um, and, and them dropping the LPR for consumer loans, or perhaps the stars were just aligned, or they didn't trust power, or whatever it might be. Uh, but gold had already broken through the nineteen hundred dollar resistance line earlier in the week, mainly on weak economic data, as I said, coming out of the U.S. housing market and so on and so forth. So, sure, the very moment that Powell started saying words, gold was slammed down. But the nineteen hundred dollar resistance that had now become support helped the metal and it helped it recover most of the losses that that it that the first words had inflicted and it then still closed above 1900 at 1915 making for as i said about a one and a half percent increase relative to last friday's close apparently the market also didn't um really care one bit for the long anticipated BRICS summer uh, summit um because well, because reason says that it's a nothing burger. And when I say reason, I don't mean mind reason that I have a lack of just as much as I have a lack of a soul. But the reason of of people smarter than me, who is basically basically everybody that I've ever interviewed in the past, who a lot of people have literally told me that it's a nothing burger. There's a few people who are really scared about it. They make good points. That makes sense to me as well. Um, but most of the most of the reasonable arguments um, are saying that that for now it's a nothing burger. So while while obviously I agree that no currency has ever existed forever and the dollar is not going to exist forever, um, and although currencies tend to lose their purchasing power over time, as they should, that's how they're designed, at least fiat currencies. The British pound has been around for over twelve hundred year, one thousand two hundred and some odd years, so roughly a thousand years older than the U.S. dollar. Which is to say that expecting that an event that would mean the end of the U.S. dollar in one swift kick, well, to me, that doesn't sound reasonable. Please do argue with me in the comments down below. I'm not a historian, not a financial analyst. I have no idea what I'm saying. I'm not an economist. So most arguments, as I said, make sense to me. So please do try to change my mind where when you see me being wrong. But the truth is that the market agrees that the with the hypothesis that the BRICS summit didn't really offer any specific guidance because again not not much happened that was no sharp moves um not on that day not at the uh, over over the entirety of the week the dollar did not fall against gold uh not too much which is to say the gold did not go up too much in dollar amounts so there was no talks about a gold back backed BRICS currency and uh the DXY index actually closed the week almost 8% in the green and so that's uh, an index that is um Basically, the relative value of the U.S. dollar to a couple of other currencies, as I said. So that's your Chinese data. That's the BRICS. That's the power of speech. Uh, I think those are the three most important things um, this week. But they were mostly nothing burgers. Actually, this week, uh, the, the, um, you know, the, the not much happened um, generally that was driving the market. So nothing out of the ordinary to, to highlight here, at least for, from what I was seeing and what I was paying attention to. Um, although, obviously... Um, I never promised to cover everything out there, so I'm definitely missing some stuff that you, again, could add on down in the comments below to correct me. So let's move on to commodities now, uh, and let's start with the best performing commodities here this week. That was iron ore. Iron ore was the best performing commodity this week. It closed the week up 8%, 8% higher in one week, and you might remember... Uh, me talking and, and reporting on economists and other people's expectations for lower iron ore prices in the second half of the year as uh, well, the rationale behind it was that China had said that it will lower its demand for iron ore because it had to lower its output of steel because it had already produced too much steel in the trailing 12 months at the end of the first half of this year. And so with them being in a lockdown at a time at, at the time that they were making these um, the, uh, policies and, and 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 projections, they had to manage the supply and demand dynamics of the steel market so that they don't crash it. And it, it, it also, I believe it also had an environmental element to it or whatever, but it turns out that they lied um, or they were wrong at least. The, the Chinese daily crude steel output actually increased this month so far, has increased this month so far in August. And if China keeps putting out steel like it has so far this year until the end of the month, which is less than another week, well, then their output would have gone up 3.6% on a year on year basis for the period of January to August, when, again, as I said, it should have really been going down. So, um, or, or at least, yeah, or at least so we're told. So, if China doesn't want to overshoot last year's production numbers, which we're again told that they don't want to do, they will basically have to cut steel output by 17% in the last four months of the year, which is generally a very aggressive target because it's not as easy to, it's just, you don't just turn off a steel mill because it, most importantly, it isn't cheap to just shut down steel mills for uh, care and maintenance. 
If they didn't, though, that would mean that Chinese steelmakers will need more iron ore. If they don't, if they just ignore all the projections that they made earlier and just keep putting out steel, they will need more iron ore than expected. And that's going to be pushing up the prices higher. That's what's been pushing the prices higher this week. I guess that's the expectation now. Uh, with the with the expectations and really the, the requirements from policymakers to Chinese steelmakers to lower steel output, the Chinese didn't stockpile too much iron ore because it's literally you know policymakers saying hey don't make that much steel and so why would you stockpile on iron ore and so again if this stimulus ends up working something that not many people are talking about or i haven't found a, a, a you know a reasonable argument that it will so this is a big if i'm just giving different scenarios if it ends up working well China, you know, if China keeps producing as much steel as they have uh, this year so far, they will just need more iron ore. That's what it comes down to, which technically should move the price equilibrium higher as it has. But again, you know, you're probably hearing the number of ifs that I'm using. And as always, I, as I always keep saying, I'm I'm not a fan of the man theses because uh, the other side of the if coin is that, well, what if they do actually put a few of their mills on care and maintenance because the property sector, I don't know, is not doing too well. Uh, or because Xi Jinping actually wants lower prices in the property sector, and that's why he's trying to crush some of these companies. And um, what if there is just just isn't as much demand for steel? Well, iron ore, you know, being a forward-looking instrument like most commodities, will will have already ran into this as it as it is as it has into the hopes of that of that happening um, of, of the stimulus working, and it will have to come down. So again, many ifs and uh, an, an uncertain type of situation, which probably means that it will sort of result in a um, buy the dip sell the rallies type of market for a while now the iron ore market is just humongous i think it's a i think it's the biggest market out there in commodities so moving it is not as moving it is not as easy moving myself to a different point though to the second best commodity this week is easier and that will have to be silver silver closed the week six and a half percent higher it closed below 25 but at 24 20 so close to it sort of in a comparable dynamic like gold only more subdued, interestingly enough, as in the rate of the moves, uh, like the power move and all that was lower than the moves in gold. So when power started talking, gold dropped very sharply. Silver didn't drop as sharply, basically. I don't have a reason why that is. I'm just pointing it out. I don't have a reason why silver is running this week. I uh, would have actually expected it to fall because industrial data out of China, as I mentioned, is not great. And monetary demand with with you know, what Powell was saying, higher for longer potentially is not necessarily looking too promising either. But again, the price well disagrees with me. And it has been disagreeing with me because silver is now the best performing metal after molybdenum on a year-on-year -year basis, being up almost 30% in the last 52 weeks and followed by a 10% move in the gold price, which was, um, although it was very closely followed by uh, palladium, which has gone up, uh, excuse me, by platinum, not palladium. It's silver, gold, platinum. Platinum's gone up 9.5% uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. And it's also gone up 4% this week. Again, uh, not much of news here, but platinum is the third best performing commodity on, on this list. So I have to mention it, but I've got no special news. And I guess just the, the DXY index being down about 4% year-on-year uh, -year and the Chinese fighting hard to protect the value of their yuan, or so we're told, while the ECB is very confidently hiking rates and, it, and they're saying that they're going to continue hiking rates, I understand why there is a, a channel for precious metals to be going up uh, when the dollar is falling. But yeah, again, I'm sorry, I don't have a juicy comics short squeeze explanation as to why silver has moved up 6% or why platinum has moved 4% or why these things are happening. And I guess to entertain the idea, could it be that the market is not trusting Powell uh, and, and they're being you know, scared by bad economic data while being hopeful for rate cuts and um, more inflation later on in the year. Sure, I can see that. That makes sense. Could it be that the market is happy with the China stimulus and Evergrande now being close to uh, resolving the bankruptcy issue, which is why the market is, is sniffing out a stronger yuan as well as a uh, stronger demand for industrial metals? Could be. I mean, I, I can see that too. Could it be that the market is wrong though and that this move is in low volumes because it's summer? And so just you know, there was not you know a bit a, a party bought some silver and it pushed the price higher than it normally would have because there's not much volume, but buying pressure will disappear if the Fed keeps hiking and China's demand disappears because their stimulus is too late, too too little, too late. Um, could be absolutely, I can see that happening too. Could it be one of seventeen dozen other options? Um, that involves derivatives, bank manipulation, and solar panels innovation. I cannot see. Why not? And if you come up with an argument, it will probably make sense to me. 
Will we know? Yeah, we'll probably know when it's too late. For now, though, I'm calling for silver or silver either going up or down or potentially even sideways. And all I know that it's just going to keep going to the right on that chart and not to the left. Hey, I didn't say that this rant will provide any you know, useful guidance. I just said that I'm here to regurgitate news and pretend that I'm working so that my wife doesn't decide to use my ear as her permanent residence and start bugging me about getting a real job because you and I both know that I'm not going to do well in a real job. But that aside, here's maybe what the market is saying. Uh, Kitco's latest gold survey who um, also shows that that Wall Street is pretty indecisive. So it's not me. That, was, that makes me feel good. Wall Street's pretty indecisive right now on precious metals. They are 42% uh, of uh, the Wall Street, the people that partake in the surveys. There are 42% are bullish on gold, 42% are bearish on gold, and 17% are being neutral, whatever that might mean. Uh, but then if you look at the uh, Main Street, which is basically the, the consensus with retail investors, I suppose, 69%, hmm, nice, 69% of Main Street is bullish, 20% is bearish, and only 10% is neutral for whatever that might be. But if, if your crystal ball isn't working either, if you're confused, if you don't know what's happening, don't worry. It seems like nobody nobody's balls are working out there. So there's that. All right, worst performing commodities, not many to report on palladium. And this time I am talking about palladium, actually. Palladium is down 2.6% because of, I, I don't know, strong winds coming from the Southwest that you know rubbed somebody a wrong way and then decided to sell some palladium. I don't know, whatever it might mean. Um, and just all the other hard commodities are either flat or, or up, not so much. Oil was doing interesting stuff, but then ended up closing flat, which also might be better than, than some people expected. So, But there's not much to report on there. So let's instead just cut that out and, and look at three headlines that stood out to me this week before I move on to talking to James Sykes about the uh, rather busy week in Uranium because Uranium did have a busy week as it has been for the last couple of well, – over a year now. So – First headline that I have on here is rather short, but it's a telling one in my opinion. And that's this one over here reading, quote, Chilean lawmakers to launch Cadelco probe amid extended copper slide, unquote. So the Chilean government will basically be doing some studies, essentially, looking into its state-owned copper miner to try and figure out why copper output has kept declining. And you may remember from a few weeks ago that Cadelco cut its copper production outlook for this year. So they had said which is already low. They had said that they're going to produce 1.45 million tons. And then they cut it last week to 1.31 or 1.35 million tons. So quite quite the drop with Kadelco being the largest copper producer in the world. And uh, these are just the lowest levels the company has seen in over two decades. They're saying 25 years. 25 years ago is when those uh, the production levels of copper were that low. And the new CEO, <clears throat> excuse me, the new CEO of Kadelco. Uh, they have a new CEO. He's coming from outside of the industry, but he was working for Kadoko before, whatever. It doesn't matter. The new CEO is now tasked with figuring out why that is, why the copper supply is dropping and fixing it. Uh, otherwise, he may be falling out of a hospital window, allegedly. Now, not only Kadelko's production has been dropping, by the way, but the quality of this business, the quality of the balance sheet has also been dropping. We were seeing more debt on this balance sheet. Um, we're seeing less cash, we're seeing higher and higher production costs and so on and so forth, and just a lot of operational issues going on. And uh, they give many reasons as to why that is all in the realm of operational challenges. They're blaming it on the weather here and there. And and the conclusion is that, at least to me, the conclusion is that mining is a, an almost impossible business. It's it's a hard business. Failure is a norm. Failure is really the expectation here in mining. Uh, this, too, is another note, by the way, on, on the board of supply-driven theses like the long-term thesis on copper because projecting mining supply is is incredibly hard to do because, again, business, my, business is hard, but the mining business is even harder. So when I look back to the, uh, the chart provided by um, S&P Global that was uh, launched last year, this is called the, the Discovery Drought Continues. Uh, well, this this one is from from last year, as I said, and it only includes data up to 2021, but it's not going to be much different. Well, it's not definitely going to be better for 2022. But so it, it's particularly startling because of the yellow line on here. The yellow line on here is the copper exploration budgets. Uh, that are now four to five times higher than those of the 90s. So we're now spending four to five times as much money as we we're spending in the 90s or copper exploration. Yet the copper in major discoveries has uh, has been since 20, 2015 onward, it's been on average four to five times lower 
than it was in the 90s, which basically means that we're spending four to five times as much money on copper exploration as we were spending in the 90s, but we're finding four to five times as little copper in the ground, which basically means that on a per pound basis, it's just getting expensive and it's making major discoveries very hard to find because the easiest stuff has already been found and mined. And this, of course, is more of a long-term fundamental piece of news, but the short term is, is not looking as certain for copper as you might want it to. And copper traders seem to not be very bullish either because as, as um as it was reported this week on August 11, it, it turns out that on August 11, investment funds had the heaviest bearish outlook on copper in a while. This is in London, and this is since the inception of the LME's commitment of trading report in 2018, which basically, well, what they're showing here is that there is a short position, um, the, the total of short positions it has reached 47,541 contracts. So this is basically a lot of people shorting copper on the LME, which you may very well want to look into as, as potentially contrarian signal, especially if 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 there is some type if I'm seeing a lot of ifs. You need to you need to notice this. If there is merit to some kind of a contrarian play for China and everybody's shorting copper, everybody's shorting China and everybody's shorting copper, that's an interesting situation. But I don't have any specific insights beyond that. I'm just saying that it's an interesting situation because well, that's pretty much that I know. So just like any other structurally challenged supply market, this will have to get resolved. Okay, long term, this will have to get resolved. Um, that doesn't mean the copper has to go to $5 tomorrow, but it also doesn't mean that it has to go to 250 but it doesn't mean that it couldn't go to 250 tomorrow. Okay, weir weirder things have happened. I actually have been right in my life. You know, that's kind of weird. I, um, I know it's hard to believe, but it happened even this week. My wife... Um, we were driving with my dad's car. I don't have a car. We we're driving my dad's car and she was like, honey, I think we should ask for directions or maybe at least use the GPS. And I said like, no, I've got this. Don't worry. You know, I'm manly, uh, toxic masculinity. I'm, I'm an alpha. Okay. I'm, I, I'll figure it out. And, um, so I started looking at the sun and all these crazy things. It turned out I actually had it. Okay. I mean, well, we got lost, but not as lost as we, we could have got. So, I mean, I was right. And, and that's, unusual so i wouldn't be surprised to see copper do something out of character too so i apologize if i sound indecisive this week i said it a few times but it's just i just don't know where the market is going this is very confusing to me which well, this further exacerbates my belief that just holding quality cash flow positive debt free investments over long periods of time while also being diversified and not only betting on one sector like not going all in on copper definitely not all in on the mining space or in the commodity space but at the same time, when you do go into the mining in the commodity space, you look for high quality businesses that have had operational success over the recent past, that have uh, high balances of cash, that are that have low production costs, so lower counterparty risk. Well, I think that's going to be resulting in in th that's going to be resulting in in the highest probability of not resulting in a loss, if that makes sense. Which I also imagine doesn't make me the most popular person in the world because I'm not throwing out a stock that is going to go 20x tomorrow, but that's kind of what I'm making out of all of this. And um, we'll do an add-on, of course, to what, what you think is, is silly or not. So, all right, next headline. I'm trying to be quick here, uh, although I'm failing. JP Morgan's most prolific spoofer is sentenced to 23 months in prison starting January 15 uh, of next year. And it's not only Greg. This is, by the way, the so-called most prolific spoofer. That's what the, his name's Greg. And uh, his boss, Michael Novak, has also been uh, convicted to spend one year and one day in prison. Essentially, why they're going to prison is because of uh, alleged market manipulation in the precious metals market between 2008 and 2016. So Greg was convicted last year on 11 charges where he essentially would well, place uh, very, very big sell orders for paper contracts on physical precious metals so that buyers who, I don't know, maybe have access to level two data or whatever, they can see those orders and get well, spoofed. Hence the nickname. So people who would have been buying, they would have said, oh, I'm not going to buy because it's going to be a, you know, a slam because there's a big, big order that's going to be selling into that. And um that's basically what spoofing the market is, where the nickname, the most prolific spoofer comes from. And if I had a soul or if I had a sense of humor, I'd probably laugh with that nickname, but I don't because this is a, well, this is not funny. First of all, in, in no, no sense, uh, it's not, I guess it's not nice for people going to jail, but it's also not great that the market is being manipulated. So it's not really not nothing much to laugh about. It's worth noting though, that this is not 
this is not over. Okay, so his sentence will be appealed, obviously. So the 23 months that he has to spend in prison could be less, especially considering that the initial wanted sentence was six years and then it was pulled down and it was pulled down again to now 23 months. So this may not sound like a lot, by the way, 30, 23 months if you're, you know, an angry an angry precious metals bull and you're holding these uh, things and you might want to get a, a longer sentence. But this is the worst sentence given uh, so far since the government has started cracking down on these uh, uh, trading practices. It's also worth noting that the judge um, it, here is trying to send a message. Okay, So normally they would, would, they would have been let to roam free after paying a fine because the uh, traders didn't profit from the crimes themselves or not directly, as you would imagine. And it, it was also not a violent crime. Okay, So normally a g jail time would not necessarily be needed here as far as I understand it. But um, well, you know, illegal things that you only have to pay a fine for basically send out the signal that it's fine to keep doing them. Um, they, they are basically legal if you pay a price. So punishable by fine basically means legal for a price. I believe there's a meme on that or something along those lines. And that's basically not what the judge wanted to communicate to the market. So he's sending them to prison. Because the last big case in spoofing, by the way, if you may remember, happened when JP Morgan admitted that 15 of its employees had indeed been spoofing the precious metals market and the treasury market as well. And they paid a $920 million fine in 2020. So it's almost a billion. I don't know if you account for inflation, it might be close to a billion dollars today. So uh, it, it was basically proven in that case that spoofing had caused more than $300 million in losses to other market participants in the bond market and in the precious metal market combined and over a, a large period of time, so over eight years. So it was not proven that it was that big, as you may expect. $300 million in loss is not a small amount of money, but you spread it over eight years and you spread it between two very liquid markets, which is the precious metals market and the um, bonds market, and that may change your perspective. And I believe that this highlights that, sure, you can take it, you, you can get taken advantage of by, by sharks in the business if you're a short-term trader. But I also believe that on a long enough time frame, real supply and demand matters way more. So yes, this is real. But if you're blaming, you know, you're you're losing positions in gold and silver, um, or, or if you're well, when it comes down to companies, like if you're blaming your shitco losing money because of banksters, and they've been losing money for the last twenty years, that's a whole nother level of discussion. It might be operational issues that are that are the problem with your company, and not necessarily the banksters here. But they have been doing stuff that are wrong, okay? So what's notable here is that beyond the example of the $300 million in losses caused um, actions like, like uh, stuff like this, they can basically cause the trust and integrity of the market to be damaged, okay? And, and, and this could cause investors to reevaluate their strategies, and this could potentially influence their trading decisions, which can have long-term valuation effects on the market. The idea is, of course, for the government to crack down on those and top at least that um and again i believe this is this is another testament that focusing on commodities that are challenged in supply and cannot be as easily manipulated and you know uh, holding uh no or low counterparty risk investments as i mentioned earlier uh until the structure issue has been fixed which is oftentimes longer periods of time than a year or two or three years instead of having a knee-jerk reaction to a, a price move, albeit hourly, daily, weekly, whatever it might be. Well, I think that's a better idea. But even then, I believe this also highlights the importance of diversification, not being all in on on, on one commodity or not all in on commodities at all, okay? Because if, if all the issues with Russian stocks and Niger stocks and, and, and this and that, if they haven't taught you that lesson yet, well, this is another thing that potentially might be trying to teach you that lesson. If you're a professional investor, it might be different. But if you're a professional investor, I have no idea what you're doing, wasting your time listening to this because there's absolutely nothing insightful here for you. All right, enough of that. Last headline before we move on to Uranium. This is just another drop in the bucket, this next uh, last headline. This is a drop in the bucket that proves that we are not. I mean, who's we? Uh, there's barely anybody, not to say nobody, but barely anybody, if anybody, is going to be hitting their climate goals. I reported two weeks ago what happened on, um, if you remember, what happened on that summit in China. I reported on Indonesia last week. I've reported on Russia. I've reported on many countries coming out and saying, hey, Westoid overlords, we're not going to make your climate goals that you literally just made up by yourself without necessarily consulting us or how that might influence our economies and, and so on and so forth, effectively in the real life. So this week, the country that I've went out on a limb and have predicted um, is eventually going to pivot on nuclear, Germany, 
had news about this. Germany's Federal Environmental Agency announced this week that its its goal of cutting greenhouse emissions by twenty uh, by sixty five percent by twenty thirty, and then going to net zero by twenty forty five are, of course, delusional. So with, with Germany is now reporting, as I said, three consecutive quarters of GDP decline, and they're, I guess, officially being into a recession right now with a composite PMI index of 44.7, which means contraction in the activities of the purchasing managers in the manufacturing and the services sector combined. Reality is basically telling them that they cannot go to net zero on time and that things are getting worse and that there are more important things than that. And this is also a testament as to trying to make the poorer countries in the world go to net zero when they really have to be thinking about, hey, what am I going to eat tomorrow? Because there's really nothing. Where am I going to get water tomorrow? How am I going to heat up my home for tomorrow when there's nothing? So, you know, weird policies are happening here. I don't like them. They don't make sense to me. Again, I might be oversimplifying it, but I don't like it. So for any and all theses requiring the man booms that was expected to occur because they would hit net zero by 2030 or 2040 or 2050 or whatever it might be. Well, news like these add uncertainty points to the demand part of the equation and may make it more risky. Uh, but now it feels like I'm repeating myself because I actually am. But it comes down to, <laughs> well, don't bet only on demand thesis. If you like a demand thesis, like lithium, nickel, whatever it might be, it's up to you to determine whether that fits your risk profile. But just maybe think about the possibility of what if that didn't happen and where would the price go if there's a low case of demand uh, or no growth or very little growth and so on and so forth. And, and then think about your position sizing. So that's about it. Unless smooth mining, asteroid collection and deep sea mining come along, I'll be I'll be shutting up now and I'm moving all, uh, over to the uranium headlines. But luckily, I'm not doing these alone this week. I'm uh, getting help from James Sykes, who is the CEO of Baseload Energy. But I do want you to know that I work as a consultant to Baseload Energy and I own um, shares of it, although I'm currently um, not profitable on those shares. So I'm considered to be biased, uh, although this discussion is not at all about the company. I just think that it's fair for you to know um, what's happening here. But let's listen to James now. All right, James, it's um, been a while since we last sat down uh, or whoever the person is who, who who's, you know, stole James and replaced it with, with this with this hairy dude now that I'm looking at. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you, but it's uh, let, let's talk about the spot market. You know, you, uh, you know, you, you, t you think it's getting tight. Uh, I think that too, because the way that the market has been behaving in the, in the, in the absence of large financial buyers, which basically means everybody was on vacation, if you will, spot was trading at a discount to nav for, um, it's been trading at a discount to nav for months now. So they've not been in the market. Zuri's not in the market. Yellow cake was in the market, but they were buying directly from Kazanum Prom. Yet the price on the spot market has kept going up and up. And now, uh, as we're recording this on Friday, the spot price is um, sitting at around fifty-eight fifty. It's recording the seventh consecutive week of um, of increases in the spot. So, what, what's happening in the spot market, James? Things are happening. Th positive things are happening. There are more purchases happening on almost a weekly basis. That we're seeing the you know the utilities coming back into the marketplace. We've seen that through news from Kazataprom and from Cameco with long-term contracts being signed and uh, more to come. So we know that the, the market is definitely picking up. Utilities are coming back into the marketplace. We've had a lot of disturbance in the uranium industry with uh, the war in Ukraine, um, the, the coup in Niger. Uh, for the last, you know, for the last decade, we've had subdued uranium prices. So things are finally changing and coming back to the forefront. We're seeing we're seeing seeing the spot price almost go up uh, a buck every month, and if that continues, you know, within two years and twenty four months, you go up twenty four bucks, and you're at eighty dollars a pound, which is the price that a lot of people are saying will incentivize new mining. But that's two years down the road, so I think it's got to go faster than that because when you consider the lag time from mining to to producing nuclear fuel, it's like an 18 to 24 month cycle, if not longer, if there are any backlogs in the in the conversion or refining processes. So I think that price has to go up uh, sooner and and faster to to incentivize the mining price. But we, uh, from what I can tell and what I've been seeing in the marketplace, yeah, we're we're right 
where we want to be. Typically, September to November is when there is a lot of activity in the uranium space. That's when utilities historically would come to the market and, and start setting all of their, their contracts. And again, from, from guidance from, from Cameco and Casataprom, I believe that this is what we're going to see in Q3, Q4. We're going to see more contracts. We're going to see uh, just more purchases being made. So a very, very positive, very positive spot price growth outlook. If you want to put it that way. There's, um, there's absolutely. And, um, generally, you know, you, you, you would think, oh, let's not listen to the uranium producers who are sort of talking their book here. But interestingly enough, this week, um, the, the, um, KEDM, that's Harris Kupperman's event driven monitor. Uh, he's a, he's a hedge fund manager, but also a, a good, very good researcher out there in, in the uranium thesis. He wrote a, a thread this week on, on Twitter suggesting that most, supply and demand models that predict uh, sort of your 180 to 190 million pounds of demand for 2024 are probably way off because of well, because of many things happening you know Japanese restarts where um it's also important to note and he notes that in there that new loads of of, of um reactors they require more uranium than normally yeah. so they require about four times as much as enriched uranium so where uh, you know a normal let's say a thousand megawatt reactor would want would require like 500,000 um, um, uh, 500,000 pounds of uranium, uh, a new, you know, if you're starting up a new reactor, you'd need 2 million pounds of uranium. Um, so it's more than the, the, than the regular demand of reactors. Then there is underfeeding to overfeeding. Then there's the, 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 the contract flexing, uh, you know, utilities flexing up their contracts, basically. Then there's reactor life extensions, Russian bans, Canada is putting some steps towards that this week, although not as serious. Uh, there's more bifurcation and so on and so forth. And so, so Cuppy is saying that demand for uranium is more likely to be around 245 million pounds next year. So about a third higher than most expected to be next year. And um, yeah, if that's true, the price will have to get get there sooner than than two years. Yep, exactly. Like we, mm -hmm. this is this is the part of the uranium cycle that that you want to get into. This is this is when investors should be getting into the uranium space as we're we're about to take off. Hmm. Well, that's it, that's also what we're seeing from um from Kazanum Promafuel is that they had their uh, first half of, of uh 2023 report today actually on Friday I believe. Um well, th th there's really well there's really a lot going on here but then at the same time not much because there's a lot of what we've already seen going on, but there's a few notable things for for people listening here that the uh Production volume on an attributable basis is uh, flat for the first half, so it's it's there's zero percent change. Sales of uranium, though, they're up, they're up seven percent. Uh, but group inventories are down, so Xanaprom is drawing down on their inventories by eighteen percent. So that's almost a fifth less in inventories than last year in the first half. And intuitively, with no production increase, but an increase in sales volume and a, and a drop in inventory, so is the average realized. Uh, price for them which is up to 47 us dollars per pound and that's from 40 us dollars per pound during the last period so that's a 15 percent increase for 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 the price that because i problem managed to realize and and so it's a 15 percent increase one five percent um while the the average weekly spot price for the first half of 2023 is actually only up four percent relative to the first half of last year so uh, uh, there's you know, James, to me, that suggests that that what you were telling me right now is 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 correct. Uh, but what else are you making of these results from Kazanoprom? Uh, they're in line with what they said. You know, they said they're going to have steady uh, steady production rates, so they're holding strong to their guidance. Uh, Twenty twenty four, they're looking at increased production, but that's also going to be because of another deposit coming online. You know, um, so I think that that's. You know, fair. I think Casataprom's done really well on that, just keeping their their guidance steady and delivering what they've said. Uh, yeah, their their value uh, compared to last year is definitely a lot higher. Like they they've produced a lot or they've made a lot more money simply because the their their contract prices are higher. Mm. So that's that's great news on that front. So you know, why would you have to really produce more when you're when you're when your value is higher for for the material? So great on great on their part. Um, what's coming down the pipelines for Xatom Prom? Again, they'll, they'll keep they'll keep their guidance steady. They'll keep their production rates steady. 
2024 could be looking at more historically you know they they did flood the market will they do that again it's a different it's a different company now as we were discussing earlier like they are they're a publicly traded company now they weren't five years ago hmm. so a little bit little bit different things to consider but they've also depleted a lot of their low-hanging fruit and now a lot of their resource is at depth and does cost more so their operating costs will go up in the future which will have an impact on on their guidance moving forward they do have some deposits that will be coming online uh, next year and that should uh, potentially alleviate or displace some of the uh, some of the material that that's at depth but i i think because prom has been been pretty straightforward and delivering as they've said hmm. so yeah um with with the guidance in 2024 increasing though that just signals that there's more need for nuclear energy that they have to produce more yeah sure is also the the utilities flexing up their contracts is also interesting to me with that but basically what that means is that um the 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 the, the, the customers of Kazanaprom they've gone to Kazanaprom and they've said hey can you give us the um the pounds that we had contracted can you give that to us a little bit earlier um, instead of later, normally they would flex contracts down because there was um, a available, you know, available product on the spot market, and so what, that that they could get their hands on for cheaper, and so they could get it while also in the same times having security with the contracts, and that's what they used to do. Now we're seeing the opposite, where I see some of the um, customers of Kazan and Prom are getting a little bit worried, maybe about Russian sanctions and so on and so forth, and they want to get their share of of, of Kazan and Prom's. Um, production earlier so um is, is that why we've seen so much demand for uranium in h1 we've seen a lot of demand for a number of reasons yes the the war but i'd say a lot of it is also this is we're living in a time that has never seen this much nuclear demand nuclear build outs have been happening globally we're seeing far more development we're seeing new country we're seeing countries develop their first nuclear reactors and as we were just talking about earlier, anytime you have a restart or new nuclear build out requires at least double the amount of nuclear fuel. So now your demand is going to increase as we continue to to expand on the nuclear energy front. Hmm. So it's just a you know, typical, typical economic scenario, supply demand. Demand's gone up, supply has to go up. Yeah. Well, but I'm wondering why is it specifically focused in the first half of this year because also just the thursday um so yesterday news came in that the value of the russian uranium imports into the u.s has surged to um to the highest level since 2005 i think that was sort of the headline so the 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 imports this year were 2.2 times larger than the imports last year uh which means that the u.s is now relying more on Russian uranium for they're relying on it for one third, so thirty two percent of the total uranium that the U.S. imports, which is almost all of the all, all of the U.S. demand gets fulfilled by imports. So about 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 one third of the U.S. demand for for nuclear fuel comes from Russia now, and so yeah, we, you know we can talk about bifurcation in the market, but the, the U.S. is still importing quite a lot of uranium, and specifically in the first half of twenty twenty three. Yeah, they're the U.S. are the largest nuclear country. Like they, they've got a lot of they have a lot of reactors, and they need to feed that. To clarify something on the on the Russian deal, though, it's not just it's not uranium mined. That's enriched uranium. The states really don't have enrichment capacity, capacity so they need to get it elsewhere. And that's you know Russia's always been a, a long time supplier. And without without that enriched uranium, you can't make fuel. So what happens to your reactors if if you're not providing the su supply required for for nuclear fuel? Hey, you shut down reactors. You shut down one reactor. That's a huge loss on the grid. So you can't. You just simply can't let the reactors not have the fuel. And I think this is a good sign that yes. The, the nuclear utilities in the state side are again coming back to the market. They know that they need more fuel now, and this is just the beginning. If you know if the states are trying to build a larger enrichment capacity on their end, and there's also if, if there's a bottleneck in the uranium industry, 
it's that it's your it's your conversion it's your enrichment that's where their biggest bottlenecks are from mining to producing nuclear fuel so those capacities have to grow throughout the year and it could be that that the american utilities or even just other utilities across the globe are seeing that too and saying like geez we got to get ahead of this because if we wait too long we're going to hit these bottlenecks and we may not get the fuel delivered when we need it to so get in now while there's still capacity, while we can still get the feed material. And then we won't run into these problems down the road. And again, with, with enrichment, you've really got a limited, uh, limited number of choices globally. So it's basically um, the US preparing for what may come in the second half of the year, which, which also might be bans on, on EUP, on enriched uranium product. I don't think they can do that. Mm. I really don't think they can. Not until they're self-sufficient, which is not an easy task and not a quick task. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's it's definitely not an it's definitely not something. Yeah. Well, but maybe that. Look at the sanction. If you look at the U.S. sanctions list on Russia, like since the since the war, uh, uranium was never on it. Not from day one, because they know that they're too heavily reliant on Russian uranium and and uranium capacities, nuclear capacities for for the U.S. market. So they couldn't shoot themselves in the foot because there was no other alternatives. Right. But it, like if they wanted to, though. Well, I'm thinking about how how that might have, but if they wanted to, they they probably have to load up on it before. So, so what I'm thinking here is 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 this? Are they trying to load up on enriched uranium product from Russia now, so that they don't have to buy as much in the second half and use the second half to restart the facilities in New Mexico? Probably. I honestly don't know. I don't know what's uh, what the politicians are thinking most of the times. But I would, I would. Time. Yeah, I would. I would honestly guess that they will continue to buy an H two. I think it's going probably going to be heavier buying an H two, hmm. even heavier than H one. Well, that that would that would put us at at quite a large number of pounds contracted and and just bought transacted in twenty twenty three. Uh, they'll be absolutely pivotal for for the uranium market. It would be, yeah. I'd, Again, that's my guess. I have, I don't have any data to really support that. Mm. It's just, just seeing the way things are are happening and transpiring. That would be my guess as to which way things are going to go. Mm. Well, it, just like Uranium Insider said on Twitter this week, by the way, he said something along the lines of, um, "Well, the, the tables have now turned, and um, we've gone from, you know, over, yeah, over a decade." Of a, of a buyer's market in uranium where where buyers got their way just they, they got whatever they wanted to um whatever type of contracts that they wanted so we've now gone into a seller's market and that's yep. clearly driving the market here yep mm. yeah yeah i mean bifurcation also is just a big thing so that's where i was coming from with the with the uranium thing because of this new invisible iron curtain i guess and, and i guess further to the bifurcation um argument in the, in the uranium market uh, and also following a headline from the Wall Street Journal that I read this week um, that I'm going to quote here is um, Saudi Arabia eyes Chinese bid for nuclear plan. That's the, the headline. And so for people listening, what's happening here basically is that, um, well, first of all, do note, uh, do note that even Saudi Arabia, one of the most important countries in the oil trade, who's got plenty of oil, they are pursuing nuclear. They are looking to diversify into nuclear as well, even though well, renewables. I'm, I'm most of the times I'm against renewables, especially in the north, um, and and especially on a, on a, on a, on a on a grid scale. But they have options for renewables as well. It's a very sunny country. It's a very uh, windy country too in some places. So they have options for renewables as well. Yet they're pursuing nuclear even still. But so do note that that's an important thing to note. But so the, the, that's not what that's not really what the um, the article is about. It's the article is about the. Um, the U.S. and the Saudis, they've, they've been going back and forward on the, on the Saudis' proposed nuclear sector expansion, um, build-out, really, not expansion. Essentially, they need help with U.S. technologies 
obviously from Westinghouse. However, the uh, administration in the U.S. wants them to forever basically forego enriching and mining uranium on their own. So they want to say they, they want the Saudis to say, OK, we're never going to do that. We're never going to touch that stuff. And obviously the Saudis don't like that. They don't like being told what to do. And so therefore they're seeing something along the lines of, hey, Joe, we just might end up working with the Chinese because, you know, they, they don't want to kill our dreams of uh, uranium production. Yep. And so. Westinghouse being the company that, that, that the U.S. company that would normally go for this contract, of course, has um, has better expertise that, in, in doing this than the Chinese. And the Saudis, of course, would want that. But uh, I guess this also just shows that they're not afraid to turn to the East instead of the West. And, you know, the, the Israeli coming into the mix makes things even more complicated because they, of course, don't want the Saudis to be able to 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 mine and enrich their own uranium. But. What should be even more worrying to the West here is 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 again the growing bifurcation of this of, of this what I think is a very very important market and um, yeah I don't know I said a bunch of things but that's what the article is about what do you make of this article James? Welcome to the emerging superpower of the Chinese and it's a battle between the Chinese and the Americans now. Uh, you know the Americans want to stay on top of the world and the Chinese want to be the new superpower. This has been happening for decades probably or at least the last decade most notably in the rare earth industry i see it all the time uh, you know we don't want to rely on chinese rare earth imports we want to develop our own um, our own rare earth industry yeah, it's not going to happen there's so many things that we're we are reliant on the chinese for and there's good reason for it and i think this is just just one of those things uh, yeah as you mentioned the saudis don't want to be they don't want to be locked up they would like to have optionality and going to the Chinese does provide them with this. Mm. Yeah. Westinghouse may have more experience, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't discount or, or hold off on, on the Chinese technology as they're a very sophisticated, you know, country they're, they've got, they've got great techno technological expertise Nuclear is kind of new to them, but I think they can deliver, and I think they can deliver nicely and rapidly, more cost-effective possibly. So I, I think it's a, personally, I think it's a good idea for the Saudis to to look elsewhere for, you know, for aid to get into the nuclear space. In the end, it's all about energy deployment for the people. It doesn't matter who the heck builds your things. You want it. You want to provide base cost, hundred percent energy all year round. You're going to get that with nuclear. So should you be beholden to one country, or should you have optionality to other countries mm. to find to figure out who's going to be, you know, your 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 best best bet, or what looks like the best bet on paper. Whatever happens after the paper part, it's always it's always up in the air. Cost overruns, blah blah blah, things like that. Hmm. But no, no, I, I think it's uh, I think the Saudis are doing the right thing. Yeah, and and even with cost overruns, by the way, if we if we look at what's happening in uh, uh in Pakistan, where the where China is supposed to be building a reactor, it's being slowed down because of red tape. Even after the uh, slowdown and the red tape and all the administrative expenses and all that, um, uh, the cost of building that reactor and the time that the Chinese think they can build that reactor for is still many times lower than uh than what the West can get done or is getting done right now so that's also an I, important. I, th I think we're in you know the whole nuclear industry has shifted and i think we're in this era that we will see more smrs we won't see these mega scale uh deployments anymore there are some that are slated and, and they are huge uh if not mistaken i thought saudi arabia was looking at a um a thousand a thousand megawatt facility one gigawatt which is a large-scale nuclear facility <laughs> which yeah that's those are the ones that typically have your cost overruns but there's there's been a decade of learning these hurdles learning the the new the new safety requirements the new um the new permitting requirements just many aspects of it and i think that with all of that out of the way they can be built on, built on on time and on budget. Um, well, on time, that's you know that's a global thing now. Ever since COVID, seems to be the the thing across the world is nothing's done on time. Mm. But on budget, well, if it's not on time, it's probably not on budget, unfortunately. 
Mm. The SMRs are are meant to meant to change that. Mm. Um, and I think that's where we're going to see a lot of new development. Once the SMRs get going, you could have people who are planning or countries who are planning on, well, let's big build this one gigawatt facility. Five years, it's still in planning stage. Next thing you know, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to cancel that idea and we're going to go to SMRs because they're quicker and, and more affordable to build and more deployable into many different areas. So it's a, you know, we shall wait and see, but it's an interesting landscape to follow. Nuclear energy is a, it's a great thing. It's a necessary thing. It's changed, changed quite a bit. And we have new players on board. Like China wasn't developing reactors 10 years ago. Mm. So this is this is all new. Now you've got a new player in the industry and they they want to expand beyond their own borders. I can't fault them for it. It's business. Yeah. This whole landscape has changed dramatically in, in a very short term, recent past, basically, which is um which is also probably not an environment in which the nuclear fuel buyers built their experience in because they if they built their experience during the last uh, 10 years before the last two years so basically between 2011 and uh, 2021 well they they grew up in a completely different world than the world that we're going into now and smrs are not something that you know it used to be a pipe dream five years ago even uh and 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 not only the, the craziest of people would bring it up but right now we're seeing i mean i've been reporting on, on nuclear uh, pivots recently and um, if someone's keeping a list of countries making that pivot um, into or back into or more heavily into nuclear, go ahead and, and just add the UK somewhere at the top of that list because, you know, I have um, I have a financial review article here uh, that is related to SMRs because that quotes, and I'm going to read it off, um, with offshore wind and solar unlikely to ensure Britain uh, has uninterrupted baseload power, the official goal is to get 24 gigawatts so that's uh quite a lot of nuclear 24 gigawatts of nuclear energy on stream by 2050 so it's a long-term thing um and uh so they want to go up to a quarter of the british power demand that is going to be uh provided by nuclear and that's going to be up from 15 percent now so the focus here is on on smrs this is a real thing it's even governments moving in that direction and and you know s spending money towards the heavily uh but, you know, that that's actually not really the point why I'm bringing this up. Why I'm bringing this up is because this goes very well in line with what um, um, what UXC President Jonathan Hinz was saying on, a, on an interview with Market Watch this week, where he said that in, in his 20 plus years in this industry, this is the best setup for nuclear power expansion that he's ever seen. So, you know, that says a lot, given given how conservative he normally is with price reporting and speeches and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you, you're pretty much agreeing with, with all that here, James. Absolutely. I've been hearing this for the past few months now, too, from a lot of professionals, guys who have been in the industry for even longer than 20 years. This is the best nuclear market we've ever seen. Demands mm -hmm. at an all-time high, supplies at an all-time low. New technologies are coming on board that can be deployed rapidly again, which further increases your demand. This mm -hmm. is a this is a great scenario, not just for the for the nuclear space, but for humanity. You know, baseload power is what it's all about. We yeah. need that. Renewables, mm -hmm. I I'm I agree. Renewables can't do it. Maybe in certain jurisdictions they can, in certain areas that have nothing but wind at nighttime and and sun during the day. Sure, they'll work no problem. And then you've got battery backups, great. But it won't work everywhere. And in those places where you need that baseload power. Nuclear is probably your best bet. Hmm. The it, it's an aggressive timeline, though, that the UK is working yeah. on, right? Do you, I mean, do you think <laughs> that's going to happen, think or is that more of a no? Because you need the investment, hmm. and until you get until you get the investment community on board, and I'm not, yeah, I'm just talking to people to invest the the larger um, larger funds out there and banks that would invest into nuclear power, which a lot of them were soured in the past because of these cost overruns. So they have to get over this hurdle now and say, okay, we're not going to run into the same hurdle. Hopefully not, because that's that'll just kill the industry as well. It's 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 a it is a big it's a big pipe dream, mm. and if they want to deliver on it, they need to get going now. Mm. Sizewell C is not enough, and well, England has its own little problems, and I've 
you know, I'll bring up size C, for example. I have talking to, to some of the people who are opposed to it. And they make a very good point that where size C is is you know going to be located, you're right on you're right on flat sea level. If sea level rises by 2050, that area could be flooded. And now you've just basically killed off a nuclear plant. <laughs> so England does have some or the UK does have some issues to consider properly and thoughtfully, but if done right, you've got a, you've got a winner with SMR technology, huge winner. Mm -hmm. Canada, look at Canada. The federal government is supporting SMR development in Saskatchewan. Awesome news, absolutely fantastic news. We get this going here in Canada, we should see some more build outs, and then and then even seeing those globally. But right. th that's a huge development, and I'm very happy to see that going. And it's I think. Once we get these proof of concepts on the go, the rest will start to follow, and we'll have our ducks in line. We'll we'll be walking in, and that's happening this week. So the um, uh, uh, Canada approving the uh, funding for SMRs in Saskatchewan is it, it happened this week. The UK news it happened this week because Adam Prom announcing you know their inventory is being down eighteen uh, percent while production is up zero percent. That's this week. All these things that we're going through. Like every week that I've been making this show for, I think I've made it 80, 80 times. I think this is the 80th uh, episode, actually, of this show. <laughs> it, 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 every time I've made it, um, the news gets more and more and more. And this is, it, it's almost like six months worth of news within a week, every week yeah. for the last almost a year now. Uh, so this really shows how much the landscape has changed. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Like, absolutely phenomenal. Mm. Great, great yeah. landscape. Yeah, I couldn't. But, I couldn't be happier being in this industry. Here's maybe somewhat of a of a counter argument that also happened this week. Uh, there was a piece of news that a, a U.S. uranium company they've managed to buy a bunch of uh, uranium exploration assets in the Athabasca Basin from Rio Tinto this week, and uh, quite a lot of it too. The company in question bought almost forty five thousand acres of ground, and um, on both sides, so the eastern the eastern and the western side of the basin too, and they only paid a million and a half for uh, for three projects in total they bought like one of them they bought 100 percent ownership in the other one was like they got a 60 percent ownership and then the third one was a 50 percent ownership but so they paid a million and a half of that why would a major a, a major mining company let go of these assets if those are good assets and if we're actually going into a massive bull market here are they not seeing what you and i are seeing i'd prefer not to comment on that you know I, i've got my reasoning behind it but good, uh, good on the company. Good on the company for picking up those assets because right now, land in the exploration in the exploration space, especially in the Athabasca, is an important thing to have. Hmm. Having land is critical. You know, what does that signal to the major? They're looking elsewhere. They don't. They don't have the outlook on uranium nuclear energy that they used to. They're probably more focused on copper lithium because those are those are the big things. Maybe small the you know uranium if you look at if you look at uranium as a whole compared to other things in the world such as gold silver you know lead nickel all of these all of these commodities out there uranium is actually a pretty small market very small chemical which is the world's second largest producer they've got they've they're actually a small company relative mm -hmm. to your to your bhps and your rio tintos and your you know, to your majors, your your Glencores. So it's it's a small part of the pie that I think they're just deciding to to let go. Mm. Could they have gotten more for it? I I think they should have. I think mm. they sold everything pretty short, but in in a way that almost makes it look like a a move of desperation that they had absolutely no desire, no future of getting into this market, even with things picking up. Mm. It's not it's not for everybody. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. If it's two hundred and forty-five million pounds of uranium world demand, which is what Cuppy was talking about, uh, and that's at eighty dollars a pound, that's not even twenty. Was it twenty billion dollars? No. Yeah. More. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not even twenty billion dollars, right? Because if if you multiply it a hundred, that would be. Uh, 
Yeah, it's a small market. I mean, that's what you were saying is that this is a this is a small market uh, in total if you look at the uh, the bigger market. But do you think that the bigger companies, sort of your BHPs and your Rio Tinto, would event will eventually come back into uranium? I mean, I know uh, BHPs got their Explore program to include uranium companies too. Not a huge deal, but it seems like it's a nod to the uranium sector as well. Do you think they eventually come back? BHPs never left. They've actually been one of the largest uranium producers in the world through Olympic yeah. Dam. Mm. And that's, yeah, can't forget that one. Outside of Olympic Dam, though, they don't really have an appetite. But Olympic Dam, uranium is a byproduct. You know, it's copper gold. <laughs> so they make a killing off that. And they then they've got a little bit of uranium when they say, yeah, we can make money off this. And they just, you know, send it out. So fantastic deposit. Mm. Rio, yeah, I don't know. I, they could come back. They got in, they got in late in the last run. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, when did they make the acquisition for Hathor? 2012, was it? 2011. 2011, they started mm -hmm. making the acquisition for, for Hathor. Everything had already come down. Actually, mm -hmm. Fukushima had happened uh, right, I think it was right around the time when Rio was coming in or right after it. Mm -hmm. So they're late. Big companies like that sometimes take long to to materialize a strategy. There's a lot of internal politics in larger companies. Yeah, internal bureaucracies slow things yeah. down as they do in the yeah. real world. So it's um, they they do well. Maybe they provide exiting liquidity for us uh, in a couple of years' time. Who knows? So yeah, like I, from the looks of it, Rio Tinto has basically sold off all of their uranium assets in the Athabasca. Yeah, they uh, sold Rough Rider. Uh, for massive loss, which is also maybe a testament yeah. to their uh, uh, uranium <laughs> uranium trading abilities. So yeah, but again, maybe they provide exiting liquidity at one point in the future when uh, you know this thing is is cannot be held back anymore. Something in those lines that that could be interesting. Yeah, let's um let's move on to a more a uh, bit of a different subject, but also related to uranium and an interesting subject nonetheless, especially this week, uh, and that's the discharging of the water that was used to cool the melted nuclear reactor at the uh, damaged nuclear power plant in Fukushima, the Daiichi nuclear power plant. So, well, essentially, again, for people listening, this is essentially putting that water out in the uh, in the ocean, not all at once, of course. The company that's in charge of all this, it's, uh, it's a company called TEPCO. They had, um, they had already said in 2021 that this m might take up to 30 years to do. So it's essentially releasing very small quantities of the water used to treat the core into the ocean where the radioactive parts will disperse into the vastness of uh, of said ocean and uh, on top of that it's also happening in a very very long period the um the media though james and and also some of the uh, neighboring countries they they seem very worried about this and interestingly enough opinions on this come from different parts of the political landscape so both left wing and right wing um media and politicians seem to be worried about this but you told me just before recording here that you aren't too worried too much. So what's happening? Uh, wh why aren't you worried? Because it's safe. There's there's nothing wrong with what TEPCO has provided as guidance. It's it makes perfect sense, and there it, there's no environmental disaster in what they're doing. None at all. I think there's a few things that I would consider why people are up in arms. And there's also a few things that people need to realize too, though. TEPCO has a bad reputation after Fukushima because they were never forthright. They were never, they weren't, or I, I guess they kept a lot of things hidden about what was going on. So they've lost a lot of public trust and that that's very damaging. And so now with them coming out and saying, yeah, we're just, we're just going to dribble a little bit of this into, into seawater and release it over 30 years. I don't think a lot of people realize that either. It's like, that's your 30 year time time period for a small volume of water to go back into the ocean. Like it gets treated for a lot of radioactive elements before that. And the only thing that's going to be lingering after the treatments would be tritium. And so the diminishing effect is to, is to really capture the, the tritium going into the seawater at lower levels at one seventh, the, the drinking water levels, which is safe. I would drink it myself if it weren't for so if it weren't for the salt in that. I don't like drinking salt water. <laughs> Take the salt out, sure. I'll I'll have a drink, no problem. Ocean so water it's, is radioactive it's, in and of itself, though, right? 
Yeah, very barely. So are, so is our blood and so is our bones. We've got radioactive elements. We've got radioactive uranium in us. We've got radioactive carbon, uh, potassium. We've got radium in our body, mm. in our blood. Yeah. We're, we are naturally radioactive material in our body. Yeah. Nobody ever considers that. It's like, you know, we're not dying because well, it's low is, amounts. There is, it's low amounts. There is as much radioactivity, as far as I understand it, per gallon of this water that was used to treat the reactor after, of course, being being treated for and, and the radioactive elements are take uh, the, the, after TEPCO takes out the radioactive elements of that water. There's as much radioactivity uh, in that water as there is in one banana. But also after the release, the water just disperses into the vastness of yep. the ocean. And so the, the level of radioactivity becomes, as you said, um, even less per, per gallon of water. Um, so it's so, a huge dilution factor. Again, yeah. you're taking 30 years for a small amount of water to go back into the ocean. Huge dilution. And that, that could be the other thing. So aside from TEPCO is that I don't think that idea is getting across to people. I, th I think a lot of people are just saying or are seeing that, oh, we're going to dump water into the ocean. And I think that they envision it just as this one massive dump scenario. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, that, that could have impacts for sure. It would disperse over time. But the, the methodology that has been approved, that the IAEA has looked at, and they're the governing body for, for you know, atomic energy across the globe, have all said, yeah, this is, this is fine. This makes sense. Because it does. Because mm -hmm. they're doing it in small amounts over a little bit of time. And just maybe people don't fully realize that. This is, this is part of the, the whole educational thing that I've been trying to do for nuclear energy for years as well. It's, it's safe, you know. Uh, there's a lot of things about the nuclear industry that people just they get up in arms over the littlest things because they don't understand. All they understand is uranium is radioactive, radioactivity is bad and kills people. That's all most people think about. They don't think about anything else beyond that. Mm. So it's a, there's a lot of fear that needs to be alleviated from public perception, and. This this could be one of those ways, uh, should be one of those ways. Take China, for example, with all their build outs that they're doing. Okay, any nuclear reactor in the world releases tritium to the ocean or to waters. It's just it's just part of the natural discharge of of the water within the, within the nuclear plant. And they're not large amounts. These nuclear reactors are so small and the, the amount of water that they use is tiny comparative to to these larger bodies. It's tritium is also naturally occurring. So it's happening all the time in the waters and in, in the atmosphere. But so you've got China doing all these build outs on the ocean. Where is all their tritium going to go? It's going to go right into the ocean. <laughs> so for having having China to come out and say, oh, we don't like what, what Japan's doing. It's like, isn't that counterintuitive? Aren't you calling the kettle black? <laughs> when you've got all of your reactors who are going to put tritium into the same body of water and more and probably in more of a concentration than what TEPCO is planning to do from the Fukushima water. Just again, it, it's, it's the messaging. It's, it's how things are portrayed and the education just isn't there. And people don't, people don't want to listen to the education side of things on nuclear. They just, they're, they're very stern and, and steadfast in their ways and, they think that they're right. It's like, oh, nuclear is bad. No, really isn't. The water going into the into the ocean isn't bad. It's not yeah. going to kill anything. All this fear of nuclear has actually made life easier for pro-nuclear people because all the fear of the last 20 years longer for, for, um, for nuclear has really resulted in um, a lot of policies and a lot of... Um, a lot of decisions being taken to make nuclear extra safe, like additionally safe, just like this water that is being discharged here. As yeah. you mentioned, when so for people listening, when James says that he he would he drink that water, he's not crazy to say that because this water contains one seventh the radioactivity of the WHO threshold for drinking water, one seventh. So, you know, you can you can you can make it seven times worse and drink it, and WHO says you'll be fine. Um, yeah. So. And they're being obviously conservative. So everything around nuclear, the way we deal with the waste, the way we deal with the build outs, the way we deal with everything has because people had this often irrational fear of nuclear 
because of all that, it's been made, it's made, you know, the government's made it, you know, made efforts to make it extremely safe. And um, most parts of the, I mean, everything is very, it's just extremely safe. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. So, yeah. Did you know that after Fukushima, um, after Fukushima happened, basically reactors across the globe had, you know, had to put in new new safety policies and, and start looking at new safety contingencies for events that could possibly happen. You know, what are we going to do if a meteorite hits, you know, hits within 100 kilometers of our nuclear plant? You know, what safety measures do we have? Things like that. From what I'm aware, it actually got quite ridiculous that even some of the, the plants in, in the States had to now start looking at what would happen if a zombie apocalypse broke out. <laughs> How are we going to make our reactors continue providing energy? Mm. And it's just Fukushima opened up a lot of eyes. It changed the landscape of nuclear energy. They we've Chernobyl did the same thing. And how many how many Chernobyls have we had since Chernobyl? Zero. Because the whole landscape changed right after Chernobyl. Same yeah. things happened with Fukushima. Right. Yeah, exactly. So the, that fear, again, has actually made life easier for pro-nuclear people like you and I, James. So that's good. We've um, we've talked about a lot. We talked about because Aaron Paul, we talked about the spot market. We talked about the Saudis in China. Uh, we talked about the UK and uh, their SMR program. We talked about this Jap Jap Japanese water thing. Uh, we talked about the US importing uranium. There's a lot going on this week. What is, uh, am I missing something, like something else that you want to talk about? Like you said, man, that's a week. That is a week of things going on. And yeah, there, there's there's a lot going on in the nuclear space. Poland's mm -hmm. looking at putting in their first nuclear plant. Um, there's there's just so much going on. Build-outs continue to happen. We've got, what, 60 nuclear plants currently in development? That's a lot. There are 4,400 nuclear reactors that are currently operational. You've got 60 reactors. That's what, 15%? Close to it? 15% of incre of demand being built. Oh, yeah. this is this is a yeah, great space. One week alone. There's a lot of information to to glean from the headlines. Yeah. I can't wait for next week. <laughs> Uh, just a note before I continue to uh, the junior um, the junior market. After the interview was recorded, TEPCO, the company that's in charge of discharging this uh, radioactive water, announced the results of their tests. So apparently, first of all, they're going to be doing quite a lot of tests. They're going to test the water daily to see if the average levels of radioactivity is going to surpass their self-imposed limit of uh, 700 um, Bercros, whatever that might be, per liter. So 700 units per liter. Uh, and uh, they, they're not going to be testing it. And the last test showed 10 units per liter. So 10 Berkos per liter, which is a, a tad lower than the WHO threshold for drinking water, which is at 10,000 Berkos per liter. So you can take the water from that's being discharged, um, make it 10,000 times worse and drink it. That's what the WHO is saying. I'm not saying this. Okay, the WHO is saying this, and you, well, you, you have to make your own choices whether you want to trust them or not. Uh, they also put fish in the immediate place where the water is being dumped to see if the fish will get a third eye, and it turns out they didn't. I'm not even kidding. Okay, no radioactivity was found in the fish. They got showered with the so-called radioactive water. No radioactivity, and that's not surprising because it's not like they're dumping green goo of radioactivity. They're dumping water over thirty years. A very small amount of water. There's no green goo here, okay? This is water that gets treated before being released into the ocean. Most of the radioactive elements get taken out of it, besides tritium, which is impossible to take out of water, or it's very hard. And there's also tritium in, in, in ocean water. But they're taken out, and that's being placed in um, into the literal ocean, which means that the tritium in that water is getting further diluted. Uh, it's getting diluted kind of like shareholders of junior mining companies. But in the end... For now, at least, this looks more like a political issue than a reality-based one. So when China says no Japanese seafood from tomorrow, well, that's more of a political thing, not necessarily a reality-based one. That's what I'm understanding out of it. Talking about junior mining companies, though, and dilution, uh, here's Luke giving me uh, the weekly overview and teaching me a very valuable lesson about how 
he profits and how he avoids losses with his uh with his strategy although uh, again fair um fair warning here this may not be for everybody so listen to it find it interesting find it educational please do be careful though this is these things are not for everybody just note that Let, let's listen to Luke all right Luke you have um quite a few names highlighted on here I don't necessarily know many of them I know of few of them but you told me they have something more interesting in mind and and like looking at these things you know i'm looking at great ego gold here it's a cse stock that's already kind of sort of uh, as we've discussed uh, maybe a yellow flag making me think about it but it's up 200 percent this week they had some news but it had they had absolutely no volume no price movement nothing for for i mean as far as back as i can go on the chart which is like last year in the uh in the spring summer actually and then all of a sudden there's a pop there's almost a hundred thousand shares changing hands twenty four thousand dollars of volume doesn't sound like a lot but it's actually a lot for this very small company and the stock is up 200 percent what so what i mean what i can see it and i can think with hindsight oh it would have been great if i'd bought but i didn't and so is there i mean is there even a chance for for someone like me to see this catch it and then maybe enjoy some of the upside, if not most of it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's that's the complete purpose of this week, I think. To I, I decided to highlight many news releases, not to discuss each of them in detail and why or why not. It may be good news, but more the process around it. Like, is it possible to do something with this type of news and how? And in the case of Great Eagle, I, I took a chart with me, a very simple chart, just a, a, an orange line, which shows uh, with, with a bit of volume in it. So you can see uh, that it was very little volume last year, uh, up to a couple of weeks ago. And I think in the Canadian markets, also in the Australian markets, but in the Canadian markets, uh, companies get recycled uh, or created. They have very low uh, outstanding shares. And there are only a few owners. When they list a new company, they probably have 200 shareholders, 250. But then they often make sure that 200 people get a very tiny position and the main holders will have most of it. And when they do a rollback uh, and they create a new company by you know, reverse takeover, uh, an existing shell, then they can clean it up as far as they want. So there may only be very little shareholders left. So that's why you see almost like a, a straight line of no volume. And often the volume increases a little bit towards the deal because these deals are sort of assembled. They are produced. Um, it is a company. They get a project into it. Then they get some people into it. Uh, they get positioned. They found apparently a project probably earlier, probably already before the management came in. So they acquire the project from someone and they can start promoting it. So it's a little, a little bit of a process to start a new company. And I'm explaining it almost in a way as if it's you know controversial and it could be but it doesn't have to be uh if you just have a private company and you have done enough work that you think it's time to bring it to the venture then you do it this way or a similar way so it's not necessarily uh obscure uh but it means that often at some point a project with nothing in it has something in it and trading starts happening. And and what you could do, which is a, it's a bit difficult, is to screen these shells, these empty companies for certain events. For example, a private placement uh, with some notes in it that insiders take a certain percentage or a property acquisition which raises eyebrows. So sometimes there are signs, but it's very difficult if you are not close to insiders or, in, or insider yourself or you don't hear any rumors to really know what's going to happen. Uh, but I play this game a little bit by buying some stock in companies where I see owners uh, or, or directors that are well-known. But these shells often are shielded by having some names in it that nobody knows and only the people with the bigger name come in the moment the project is acquired. So in this case, Great Eagle is sort of a newly established company from the shell called Misa2. And now it's a new company and suddenly there's trading. So uh, this price is really, you could call it an artificial price. And the real price is only set when free trading dates, you know, when financings are done and free trading da dates are over. And that's when you really see a price settle somewhere. Uh, but if you would have spotted this company a couple of months ago 
you could perhaps have bought ten thousand dollars if you wanted to take the gamble, and that ten thousand dollars is now worth thirty thousand dollars. But there was no volume in the market to buy fifty thousand dollars or one hundred thousand dollars of this type of stock uh, because it was just a shell. So that's that's the story behind Great Eagle. Without me knowing anything about Great Eagle, it's pretty obvious that this is a created company, as most companies get created at some point uh, by a through a shell or through a new listing. How do you know when a project that has been added to a shell like this even makes sense? I mean, this this is now a $12 million market cap company. I know companies with real deposits and even multiple discoveries on them that are trading for less right now in this market. So how do you know whether this is too much or whether you have more upside to go to? I, I think that this might, by the way, be a good, good point to move forward to uh, Founders Metals too, because they were in a comparable position not too long ago. So yeah, yeah, completely. I think it's 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 very important if you invest in uh, the public shares. You know, if at some point these these companies come out with their story, the new placement, and they often go to a network of people that get the opportunity to buy this stock. Like founders, I think started financing end of last year. I met them in at a conference in Toronto earlier this year. Uh, when the finance was not closed yet, and I asked them, uh, they were there for a different company because it was a group running a couple of companies, and I asked them about founders, and they said, well, if you want to participate and you can be quick, you can do the subscription agreement and join this financing, which I didn't. It was a 20 cents financing, uh, and they told me at the time, hey, this is a comp- project that was drilled in the past. Here are the drill results, and they looked amazing, like 10 grams over 80 meters. Then why did the previous company not continue? Uh, often because it was small, high grade, but small, and they didn't find enough to make it worthwhile. And then a new company comes and they see potential and they buy it again. And then founders, I think, started a little bit like that with a high grade property in Suriname. Um, And I asked them, like, are you going to drill these? Are you going to twin these holes? And they didn't say twin, but they kind of confirmed that, of of course, they will start where previously... Uh, they hit gold. So it, it, it makes sense to start close to the previous holes, which means that you start with good news releases. Um, so I wasn't surprised to see founders come out with good news a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the stock didn't really react much to it. Probably because the financing became free trading and uh, there was enough supply. Uh, there was $3 million of buying in the financing. That money, that was in the money. So investors took the opportunity to sell their stock at 30 cents uh, and keep the warrant. And that's why the stock didn't really move much. And now they came out with an, with an even better result, 15 meter at 30 grams. And the complete point I think is of today's meeting, uh, at least what I want to get across is at this point, I have no idea if what founders drilled is a good result or an expected result. And I think you cannot trade founders or buy founders without knowing if they just twinned a previous hole or if this hole is really meaningful, is this a step out? Is this a new understanding of a system? Uh, so you need to read the, you need to read the news release properly, and you need to go back to the previous results to see, you know, what does this really mean? And then probably you have to call the company and ask them for context. And only then, I think you can trade founders or buy founders. Uh, and and so my point is, even with a headline like this, fifteen meters at thirty grams, which is an amazing headline. It, there's no guarantee it's meaningful uh, because they did have holes like this in the past. And frankly speaking, I really don't know. I didn't do the work, do the work uh, in, the, in the past weeks to determine if this is meaningful. But the market tells us it is because it went up 80% on pretty substantial volume. Um, so my point is not to explain whether founders is good or bad. It's really the process of analyzing the news, understanding where it is, understanding the financing that became free trading, and uh, that has a big effect on the stock price. And in this case, it seems to work out so far. Yeah, it's just, a, I mean, you, you had this, um, yeah, the, the, this other chart just showing the volume on it. Uh, it you, you basically need to understand if the company, well, what I'm getting from you here is you basically need to understand whether the company is going to be able to keep coming up with news that will be creating, um, you know, volume events so that the stock can basically carry the selling that comes through, that comes through on the free trading date. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think 
a hole like this, 15 meters at 30 grams, if this would be a greenfield discovery, uh, and it confirms the concept that the, the company has been explaining to investors for many years or many months, and they finally hit this in a greenfield project, a hole like this is amazing and the stock will continue to go because it could be that next big discovery. I simply don't know about founders if this hole is changing the complete game. I really don't know. But indeed, if you, I, I made this chart of the financing, there were 80... Uh, I have to back up a, a little bit. I'm not sure if there were 80. The, the number, I have to check again. But there were a pretty substantial number of investors in um, the founders' financing. Yeah, 83 places. So 83 people owning 20 cent stock with a half warrant at 30 cents. They put in thirty million, uh, three million dollars into the company, and that three million dollars is now worth more than nine or ten million dollars. Not even considering the warrant. And before this good news, or before this news, assuming it's good, there was about forty thousand dollars in volume every day, and suddenly there is nine million dollar, ten million dollar of free trading stock with people who own a warrant. So that that nine or ten million dollar has a reason to sell unless they really believe in the project and they will keep it. So I'm not suggesting that there will be $9 million of selling, but there's a potential for $9 million of selling. And that's why the $40,000 is tiny in comparison. Uh, but as long as the company can really increase the value of the project, and that's why this news release is so important, if this is really increasing the value of the project so dramatically, um, the company could go much higher. Uh, but if this is 10 meters away from the previous drill hole, and it just confirms that the system is 10 meters bigger, well, then there is a lot of risk. And the next hole is going to be crucial to see if it can, if it can sustain this uh, market cap and the share price. More importantly, the share price. Um, so that's the complete game, I think. Understanding you know, who owns this stock, what's the risk of this thing coming back down again, is this a real discovery or not, and... You know how how good will the next hole have to be to keep this value or to increase the value, and that's the difficulty of discovery investing or exploration investing, uh, because in most cases you need the next hole to be better, at least similar or better than the previous one, to keep the story alive, uh, because it's all based on supply and demand of stock, and the company is not creating any money; it's just creating news flow. Uh, so news flow versus stock. And that's the complete game, I think, to understand. And that's why I didn't buy founders uh, because I couldn't, I didn't evaluate it properly enough to know if this 30 meters um, or this 15 meters of 30 grams is a game changer or not. It's interesting how you look at this as um, was a real speculator, I guess, because you, you're mostly thinking about, as you should, uh, in these things that are speculations. You're not thinking about value it's also very hard to stick a value to something like that you're thinking about what kind of a price moving event will this create and if there's a bunch of shares coming free trading that are not making money or making a little bit of money but already have the free upside through the free warrants that they got well that's going to create you know downward pressure on a lot of volume can this stock really mop it up they could if they create a lot of excitement and so they create also upside pressure with a bunch of volume of new people wanting to come in because they've uh, de-risked the project or moved it to a further. It, it, I mean, you look at this very differently, I guess, than than a lot of people do. So I, I, I do appreciate that. This is also what the last chart is, I suppose, that you have here with you. Uh, you mean the one with uh, the orange dollars? Yes. Yeah. So this is, uh, of course, I'm... I'm a little bit, I sound maybe a little bit skeptical, uh, but that I think the, the the game often is, and that creates a lot of wealth, but also a lot of bad stocks, is acquiring a new project that for some reason seems exciting, uh, getting the insiders seated, which makes sense. Sometimes it feels like, oh, why do they get five cents stocks and I stock and I have to pay fifteen cents or twenty cents or twenty five cents? That often feels unfair. Uh, but depending on how much work the founders did or just finding this property, I think it's it's okay that they get cheap stock. Uh, it depends how cheap it is. And so you get that acquisition, you get the people see this. In most cases, you get some good initial results because there was a reason to buy the property and they have to release that news. And I think companies do a little bit of news planning. So even though in the announcement, they will explain what they bought and why, 
in most cases in the months after they will come up with some good surface samples and you know people think oh wow this looks interesting and then they start promoting it a bit more good news so let's do a financing three or four times higher than the than the initial price that the founders paid and uh and and then there's often more good news <laughs> and, and there's a bigger financing. And this is a little bit what, what happened with Rome Resources. Rome is another company that went up this week. And even though I sound very skeptical, this is probably the way to do it, uh, to create a new company. But as an investor, you constantly have to weigh, like, is this, this good news really good news or is it just building, slowly building a nice story and then uh, doing a big, bigger financing even in anticipation of a bigger drill program? And then the results come out of the drill program, and that will often tell the story for the time being, good or bad. And the, the headline will often read, positive news from XYZ, from this showing and that drilling, and that doesn't mean a lot, um, because they will never say negative news from the drill program. It will always be positive, even if they <laughs> didn't find much. So. The headline is often a bit tricky. Uh, you have to read the news and understand what was expected by the market, or at least the investors in this stock, versus what did they just provide. Mm. And if it's amazing, the company will very quickly move forward with a new new drill program and a new financing, and they can keep the thing going. If the news is disappointing, so disappointing that the company even scratches their head, like, hmm, this hole really had to hit because now it's... Now with these results, it's not no longer confirming our thesis. Then often you get a period of very quiet uh, news flow, and that's when the stock often starts lagging. And people, some people sell early, and some people only find out a couple of months later. Like, oh, this story seems to be over, and I'm back, uh, you know, below my cost average. Um, so this is the often what happens. You know, you see a stock go up, and at some point disappointment hits, and the stock goes down. And in very few successful cases, the company can really keep on building that value like Founders is doing right now. And and it becomes an amazing story and everybody will like it. And uh, it's, it's a, a book will be written about it five years after or 10 years after. So I think this is important to know that you always have this news flow that is often pre-planned in a way uh, because you need to keep that news flow coming to keep people excited. Yeah. I don't think I have any other things to add. And so I think that's a good note to end, end it on because, it, yeah, it's very good takeaways. Yeah, so so just to, to summarize, uh, I highlighted a lot of news releases this week of things that I find interesting. I decided not to go into those news releases, but in rather talk about, you know, one company that's just getting started, Eagle, Great Eagle, and one company that is started and is going well, Founders Medals. Um, yeah. You really have to, to, to make a decision to buy or to sell on news. You need to know the expectation and not just the headline and the first paragraph. Uh, Aldoro Resources this week went down because they did an XRF earlier, which suggested good news, came with essays. They were disappointing. Um, right. That's means a, it, yeah, I'm sorry for you. That's something I noticed that in the list. But you can before you move on, to, do talk to me about because I do want to talk about Talk to me about the... XRF results. It's very funny. I don't even know why companies make news releases. But I, I don't understand it. It makes absolutely no sense to me. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense to me, to be honest, uh, because it's companies find themselves in difficult positions, especially in Australia. In Canada, companies have a little bit more freedom, I think. Well, they have to release news when it's material news, for sure. But in Australia, the rules are even stricter. And when a company drills something that looks visually you know, significant and potentially changing the company's... Uh, valuation they have to bring that news as soon as possible as reasonably possible and if uh, the company will also get an immediate um, email from the exchange if the stock starts trading without news and they will ask hey what happens and explain this to the market please what is happening over here uh, so a company can either explain the visuals or they can also add any measurements that they may have for example the xrf and i think it's tricky for sure maybe explaining the visuals and showing you know, ex providing pictures as detailed as possible with descriptions of what the geologists see in the core is the safest way to go. But I think in Australia, companies will have to release something if it's visually interesting. Uh, otherwise, they are not releasing material results. And since essays can take six, eight, nine weeks, 
uh, they cannot leave that in the open uh, because some people will find out. You have you have people in the essay lab, you have geologists, you have CEOs, you know, perhaps family members. I mean, I think it's very difficult to control good news, and that's why in Australia they they force the companies to release it as soon as possible. Hmm. I, yeah, I'm kind of split on it because so I understand that part, but it it also looks a little bit sleazy to me when you know that there are going to be people out there reading that and thinking, oh, this is a new discovery. Some companies announce a new discovery on XRF results. And that, I mean, that that also makes no sense to me in terms of the, the valuation of the company. I understand it, that they have to, um, I mean, a technicality, as you mentioned, following the exchange's rules, but it's, um, I don't know, it's a... It, uh, it sounds sleazy to me when when you know that some people are just going to assume that these are assays. There's a lot of people participating in the sector that don't necessarily know or understand the difference between an XRF, um, quote unquote, discovery and a real, you know, drill discovery. Yeah, I think judging, I think indeed XRF is very tricky. Uh, visuals can also be tricky. Last year there was a company with very nice core. Uh, core that was compared to uh, Voices Bay. And they were kind of suggesting in the news release this could be that next Voices Bay discovery. And the stock went from 10 cents to a dollar in a matter of days or maybe weeks. Um, diamond fields. I mean, I looked at a lot of discoveries in the 90s. And you see that it often the company often went up 3 or 4x before the actual essays came out. So there is interest. You know, if a company comes out with uh, Voices Bay said potentially significant occurrence of base metal mineralization containing nickel, copper, cobalt, drill holes from uh, drill core from four holes en route to lab. You know, they they even Voices Bay in the 90s already described what they found, and the stock went up from I think about a dollar to uh, close to three dollars when the news actually came out. So a three bagger, and. Considering that Australia companies are really forced to bring out any significant news, you have to also do something with the visuals. And the company needs to decide, like, do we also do XRF or do we just do pictures with logging uh, descriptions of core? And I think the last option is better. Aston Bay did something similar as well with American uh, West recently. Um, and I liked it when they had the, the, the tables and literally were describing from this meterage to this meterage, we found this in the core. And then at least as an investor, you can really go through those tables and make up your mind based on their knowledge because their knowledge is mostly your knowledge because they released it. Uh, so indeed, XRF is tricky. Uh, visuals and descriptions are probably needed in law if you have long essay times. All right, that's all that I'm allowed to tell you this week um, by my overlords. I'm on Discord, although there doesn't seem to be much happening on there right now. and still have some hopes that eventually there there will be. I'm not charging for it. So if you feel like joining, please do go to resourcetalks.com. It's free to use. It's easy to use. You don't need a registration. I'm not getting your email. Um, you can either go on Discord, register to Discord, which I guess would acquire your email, but that's not going to come to, come to me. Um but if you just want to chat like a few times or whatever, you can just put in a nickname on the website and chat without you having to do anything else, anything like that. So, uh, yeah, I wish you a great week and thank you for listening to me or thank to whoever forced you to listen to me. Just know that they probably don't really care much about you and um, if they're wasting your time on me. And if you made yourself listen to this, well, I'm not a life coach yet, but I feel like you may want to rethink some of your life choices. And if your kid was on the iPad, and this was the next video in, in, in the row, then you might want to send YouTube an email to make sure what kind of content they're suggesting to your kid because this might be damaging to their brains. All right. Thanks again for um, being here. Enjoy the rest of your weekend or the week whenever you might be watching this. And uh, if all is well and fine, I will be back next week. Thanks again.